like, like Sean, uh, my empirical starting point will be uh, with the recent major transformations in migration dynamics uh, across and around the Mediterranean that has affected very, uh, you know, uh, importantly the, the whole region and, and beyond. Uh, but while my primary focus, so to speak, is European responses, my main focus is indeed uh, uh, on what these responses are producing in terms of impact on African polities as one of the main, uh, you know, targets of these, or partners, if you want to put it differently, of this uh, new policy approach, to some extent new policy approach. Just briefly, the ground I will try to cover in these 20 minutes, first some background quickly on, on recent African migration to Europe and how it shapes our perceptions and policies. Um, then uh, I will say something on what I consider uh, the key development, namely a, a dramatic change in policy priorities of European Union and member states, uh, with a growing prioritization of sub-Saharan Africa in, in European policies on migration, but also the other way around, a growing prioritization of migration in other policies of European actors in, in Africa. Um, then I, I'll come to my, my fundamental interest, which is in this paper of the impact of such changing priorities on African countries and on African polities, which is, I think, a crucial but still quite neglected issue, both in the policy domain but also in the scholarly uh, domain. Uh, and I will say a few words, if I have time, on the kind of theoretical tools that I try to apply to this to the study of this, of this topic and, and introduce briefly this concept that I try to, to propose of negative extraversion. Uh, and then finally, some, if I have time again, some, some brief remarks on implications for future research and particularly for Afro-European cooperation uh, on, uh, in the field of migration policy uh, studies for the future. Now, briefly on, on perceptions of what has been happening uh, in, the, in the last few years uh, across the Mediterranean and around it. If one Googles African migrants just like this, you know, uh, what comes out as a first image is this kind of image. So a, a very peculiar and very partial uh, representation of a destitute, uh, disorderly, chaotic, and miserable and potentially threatening phenomenon which is something which is clearly not representative. Uh, you know, Professor Tapp reminded us how South-South migration is still largely predominant, but this is what comes out in a global arena if you try to you know, give these two keywords, African migrant. Uh, and the official narrative, at least in Europe, reflects this kind of distorted perception. Uh, Frontex, which is the European border uh, agency, uh, talks in one of it, in its last uh, strategy report of a steady increase in migration pressure from the African continent and in particular West Africa. Now, is this correct? It depends on where you look and what you look for. If you look at irregular crossings of the Mediterranean to South of Europe uh, and the nationality of those arriving in particularly in Italy, which is currently the main uh, point of disembarkation, of arrival, indeed Western African countries are prominently uh, represented, but this is certainly just one of the modes, of the types, of the channels of migration from Africa to Europe, although by far the most visible and the most influential one in shaping perceptions and policies, at least in the global north and certainly in Europe. This is the first two quarters of 2017. Uh, you see, Nigeria is the largest sending country, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, uh, and others, uh, much smaller than what currently is uh, the Middle East that has been, until the closure of a so-called Balkan route, the largest sending base. Hmm? And then you have Bangladesh as, uh, as an important uh, sending, but crossing uh, through Libya as well. Uh, now, all this situation is uh, tightly and uh, you know, strongly associated with a contingent situation in Libya. These are uh, irregular arrivals in Italy uh, over the last few years, and you see that the peaks, 
in 2018 and 2014, then with a uh, stabilizing uh, on, on very high numbers, are both connected with key developments in Libya. So all this situation is, uh, you know, uh, almost inextricably associated with the specific policy developments in a given country, which is Libya, which has turned into the main gate of access for this type of African migration uh, to, to the European uh, continent. Uh, 2016 has been an all-time peak uh, with substantial, like always, seasonal variations when you talk about uh, maritime uh, migration. Uh, total arrivals were, as I said before, as I showed in the previous picture, uh, over 180,000. Uh, what happens in 2017, the, the trend has been reversed recently. I, I give this just as a brief uh, background. Arrivals uh, in 2017 until the 15th of September have um, gone uh, down considering the seasonal effects uh, to 100,000, which is still uh, sizable. Uh, but there is a, a very clear decrease after uh, August, uh, uh, which are normally uh, uh, months of uh, very important uh, arrivals, volumes. The uh, reason why there was this if not closure, uh, major reduction of arrivals through the Libyan uh, route is a long-standing diplomatic effort by mainly by Italian uh, authorities, which has brought results in the final few uh, weeks and months. You know, we have a meeting where, between the president, uh, the prime minister of Italy, and and uh, Fayez al Sarraj, the, the prime minister of. Uh, 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 government in, in Tripoli in February, a meeting with uh, leaders of southern tribes and the Ministry of Interior of Italy, a very unusual kind of diplomatic configuration. And again, uh, Minister of Interior of Italy with uh, uh, his uh, counterparts in Niger, um, Chad and, and Libya. This has produced uh, results and basically is so far creating a major reduction of arrivals across Libya. Uh, but beside Libya, and here I, I shift to, to, to Africa, to Sub-Saharan Africa, which is uh, the main uh, sending basin for these kind of flows, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has emerged over the last couple of years as a key priority for European migration policies. Uh, I try to, to very quickly uh, reconstruct the, the evolution of European policy responses to this crisis, there was first an attempt to, to manage it, to fix it internally by redistributing arrivals among member states. You know, there was the adoption of a sort of relocation program in order to distribute those arriving amongst all the 28 member states and not only the, the countries of first arrival and final destination, namely Germany and Sweden mainly, this failed dramatically. After this failure of internal responses, there was a very uh, dramatic shift to, to external responses. If we cannot uh, welcome them uh, in a, in a uh, homogeneous and balanced way, we'll try to stop them from coming, you know, to prevent arrival. And this uh, shift to an external response uh, had a, a very crucial turning point in March 2016 with the uh, agreement with Turkey that, as you know, brought to an end of transit across the Balkans uh, to, to uh, Eastern and Central and Northern Europe mainly. In all this, uh, uh, Africa emerges as a key priority in the fall of 2015 with a a uh, big uh, uh, summit of EU, AU, uh, African Union leaders in, in Valletta, in Malta, uh, followed by the, the adoption of an EU emergency trust for addressing root causes of irregular migration, as the jargon, the, the official language of the European Union goes, uh, and uh, an injection, a substantial injection of uh, development fund aimed at preventing migration through this fund and other uh, financial facility. June 17, uh, uh, the European Union launched its partnership framework with third countries uh, for, for purposes of mitigation of a mig migratory pressure. Uh, 
partnership framework with third countries, but it is essentially about uh, African countries, sub-Saharan African countries, and particularly about a, a handful of African countries that have been uh, you know, singled out as uh, absolute priorities for this new uh, wave in, in European policies on, on migration. And uh, the official priorities of a new partnership framework are these five countries, uh, Senegal, Mali, Niger, uh, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. In the policy of the European Union, however, there are also other uh, priorities. Well, two are obvious, and, and we get back to the Sean's presentation, uh, Lebanon and Jordan as uh, two major receivers who are in need of help in order not to release this, you know, big numbers that they were able to retain. This is in the perspective of many decision makers in, in Brussels and elsewhere. Uh, there are some unofficial priorities that cannot be directly and explicitly addressed in a policy because there are some, somehow uh, critical uh, situations that you cannot easily address in an explicit and formal way. So Sudan, Eritrea, and, and Somalia are certainly at the core of, of the diplomatic and, and policy uh, and security effort in this case. And then you have this constant semi-official uh, super priority, which is Libya, which is the, uh, uh, the, the main uh, channel for, for these uh, flows in this highly securitized uh, Weltanschauung that is uh, emerging in European capitals associated with African migration. Uh, this, uh, I argue, is a, it's a deep transformation of European strategic approach to Africa, and it is not just a prioritization of sub-Saharan Africa in European migration policies, which is clear, but it is also, on, as I said, the other way around, a prioritization of migration in other policy areas. So migration becomes prominent in, uh, particularly in the field of development policies with these ideas, uh, the, this idea of addressing root causes of migration as a priority for development policies, but it also becomes uh, crucial in, in the area of trade, for instance, and think of the uh, great uh, centrality that migration is assuming in the debate on the future of the EU-ACP uh, partnership under the post-Cotonou uh, uh, framework. Uh, so what is emerging, I argue, is a sort of pan-migratory approach uh, where uh, the uh, migratory variable becomes uh, key in driving policy choices, strategic policy choices by European actors in, in the uh, African context. Uh, this has, I, I think, attracted insufficient uh, public attention, but particularly scholarly attention, uh, certainly in Europe. This approach, this pan-migratory approach, uh, I, I'm, I'm really running through, through maybe too many uh, contents that I put in this presentation, but is, is uh, relying upon some, is based upon some fundamental conceptual ambiguities and, and practical dysfunctionalities. Uh, conceptually, it is heavily based on a very uh, questionable uh, assumption, namely that development can be a way to prevent migration. We know that uh, most economic and social sciences literature points in the opposite direction, uh, says more or less the opposite, although I, it's much more complex than this, and here I, I'm in a temple of, of development economics, but uh, the idea that root causes can be addressed and therefore uh, migration can be, uh, can be stemmed is, is very much at the core, at least of the official policy agenda of a, of a European Union in this phase. Uh, practically, in the, in the short term, the money doesn't even go to development because it goes primarily to security objectives, so to border uh, control strategies, uh, rather than to development priorities and development actors. And I'm get, getting back to this and to the implications of such uh, distribution of aid in a second. Uh, the risk, uh, just to, to, to characterize this very, very, you know, maybe in a simplistic and quick way, but is that this approach, this unbalanced approach, brings to a temporary re reduction of migration pressure, of course, but maybe to a constant, uh, uh, if not augmented, propensity to emigrate, uh, plus other uh, perverse effects. I'm, I'm trying to explain this uh, 
well, just briefly, my, my theoretic, maybe I, I'll drop this because it's in, uh, I, I'll have a, you know, an attempt at finding some, at forging some theoretical tools to explain this in the paper, and uh, I think I, I should rather, uh, you know, uh, send, you, send you there for this, but uh, getting back to the negative side effects of an unbalanced uh, migration control uh, externalization. Uh, uh, first phenomenon, these are not research findings, I must say, but rather research hypotheses for a research agenda that I think we should probably think of developing together. Uh, the, the relationship between donors in this phase, this type of donors, uh, is mainly with security apparatuses in uh, what are singled out as key sending and transit countries for this kind of irregular migration, which is the core concern for Europeans. And, you know, uh, channeling money on security apparatuses, of course, creates imbalances, further imbalances in in polities which are sometimes already quite unbalanced from that point of view. Uh, and some possible examples of uh, unintended, indirect negative effects of this kind have been pointed out by advocates, but, but by policy advocates, but also by, by, by researchers in countries as diverse as Ethiopia, Turkey, Sudan, uh, it's very hard to substantiate this kind of general assessment on, on the policy impact at such a strategic level, but it is something that should closely monitor, but also uh, researched in a, in a systematic and consistent way. Uh, another uh, problem with this, uh, you know, what can be roughly, maybe a, br a bit brutally called outsourcing of migration repression, is that it can undermine consensus to local uh, governing elite, because basically it, it is a delegation of migration control on their own people to local governance. In certain contexts, this is uh, very clear. And for instance, there are scholars of uh, so-called Arab Spring who argue that the restrictions to emigration for Arab youth was one of the component in creating the uh, explosive potential that generated the Arab Springs in 2011. A third possible, you know, strand of unintended uh, effects, yes, thank you, uh, is on uh, uh, enhanced uh, pressure to uh, s uh, beef up, to reinforce border controls also in sending and transit regions may have a disrupting effect on attempts at regional economic integration. And this is something that has been witnessed in the past in the Western Balkans, for instance, with the introduction of hard borders in areas which were, which used to be uh, areas of relatively free exchange of persons and goods. And this is something that you know, has been seen emerging also in the ECOWAS uh, region and again, this is not a hard research finding, but rather suggestions and, and hypotheses for future, for future research. Finally, increased controls is demonstrated to be also a, a boost to uh, irregular uh, migration, and particularly to those who are able to uh, capitalize on uh, demand for irregular migration. Uh, effects of this kind, professionalization of smugglers, and uh, incentive to corruption have been clearly observed in the, along the frontera in North America between, between uh, Mexico and, uh, and, and the US, but similar effects are being witnessed of displacement and reinforcement of irregular trends and smuggling trends are witnessed. This is mainly you know, kind of journalistic accounts and some research accounts in places such as Niger and, and other Saharan uh, localities. Uh, perhaps even more fundamentally, and I will conclude with this slide, uh, what is at stake is international standards and values. I, I'll read, yes, just let me read these few lines, uh, if, if I may. Uh, governments in Africa are watching what Europe is doing. They see how Europe wants to prevent migration because Europeans think of migration as a problem. 
As a consequence, some of our government, it is of course an African person who speaks, are changing their approach and copying the European template. They have started to make deals with other countries to make sure that people stay there. Some African governments are now using Europe as an excuse for not taking responsibility. They say, if Europe doesn't do it, why should we, with fewer resources, do it? This was, I think, a very effective uh, discourse by, by uh, a person who is an executive director for South Africa of Oxfam during the European Development Days uh, in, in Brussels just a few months ago, and I think I, I would like to conclude with these, I think, uh, very uh, thoughtful and powerful words. Thank you.